And then exhale that box one. All right. Very close. <laughs> Hi, everyone. strange because I'm look, trying to look at the camera and yeah. also look at these things. So this is Deborah Caldwell. She's our diversity resident librarian. We're just going to hand it right off to her to get started. Um, thank you for dealing with our technical difficulties as we try to figure things out. But it's all you. OK. Um, well, I can't see my own slides on that monitor, so I'm going to use your computer. Go for it. Yeah. OK. Mm -hmm. So hi. <laughs> I can just put the. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, so, uh, I don't know. Okay, there we go. Hi, I'm Deborah. <laughs> I'm Deborah Ian Caldwell. I'm the diversity resident librarian. Can, do you want to shut the door? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm the diversity resident librarian at USCG Libraries. It started in October. Um, and I'm happy to be here today to talk a little bit about the diversity residency program. Um, and a little bit about myself. Uh, Tori was a little vague about <laughs> what to speak about today. So um, it'll be a little bit about me and my background and how I got here and then um, delve a little bit more into diversity residency than what I'm doing here as a resident. Um, so, oh, uh, I shouldn't sit and go. That's okay. Um, so <laughs> there's some day photos of me because I got distracted when looking for pictures of myself in Korea and wanted to share baby photos. Um, so they I can was, see them. Yeah, like you can see them. I just can't see them on the screen. Yeah. So I was born in Korea. Um, I'm half Korean. Um, and there's some evidence there because I don't have any more recent photos of Korea on my laptop because it died not that long ago and I had to replace everything. Um, so I was born in Korea, moved to the U.S. when I was about five years old uh, to Louisiana. I uh, went to undergrad uh, at CU Boulder and studied anthropology there, um, uh, Boulder, Colorado, uh, for anyone who doesn't know. And then I moved back to Korea for a while, um, did my master's degree at the University of North Texas, Master of Information Science, which is, of course, ALA accredited. Um, and now I'm here. Um, so a bit more about me. Oh, I downloaded the font. Really want to I'm going to give you another version <laughs> to upload um, to share with people. Um, so, uh, the yeah, University of North Texas for undergrad. Um, while I was there, um, I worked on a variety of projects, uh, including you know, I, I got started with Data Rescue, which was happening in fall of 2016 because um, of those certain reasons, things that were happening in the world right about that time, um, which is uh, when I started grad school. Um, I also did. Um, I also work with DLF, um, the Asian Pacific American Library Association. Um, I did some stuff with Open Data Day um, and our local open data portal in Denton. Um, I've also been really involved in the PEGI project as a project manager for them as a student, um, first student, now just a, like, I don't know what my title is now that I'm not a graduate student project assistant, but I guess we'll work that out. Um, and among other things. Um, let me back up a little bit. So one of the things that drew me to librarianship um, was that I realized there were certain things that I really cared about in my personal life. Right? I did my undergrad in anthropology because I like humans, I like studying people, and when I found out anthropology was a degree that you could get, it felt a lot like cheating. Like, oh, I don't have to pick a degree after all. I can pick whatever thing I want to study and then call it the anthropology of that. Um, and then, you know, I don't have to narrow myself that way. Um, but I, you know, I got onto the workforce and was trying to find other kinds of work. And you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because eventually, you do kind of have to pick something. If you don't have a PhD in anthropology and want to teach or, or get a job at the Forest Service as an archaeologist, it turns out, generally speaking, especially in the fall of the, um, in the aftermath of the crash when all the humanities, everything were being cut. Um, at the time, I did not have the, the funding um, or the wherewithal to be able to go to get a higher degree and master's degree in anthropology or much less a PhD. Um, so I was looking for other things and it took a while, but I realized that um, this interest that I had in technology and, you know, these tools that we use in our everyday lives, I'm an older millennial, I guess, and like kind of like the, the upper end of that spectrum of what counts as a millennial. And if you like the term digital native, you know, born digital native, um, which there's some people who have issues with that, um, that felt like I, I would kind of consider myself in that category, very comfortable with technology and um, existing on, you know, on the web and 
um, developing my relationships there, which is you know what social media is all about, the social aspect, right? And as I was casting about you know 2014, 2015, deciding you know what I want to do, if I really want to go back to school or not, and if so, do I want it to be in another humanities degree, um, like anthropology, or if I wanted to specify into something else? There was a lot of things happening at that time. Um, a few years prior, I'd been paying a lot of attention to a lot of like the Arab, the Arab Spring uprisings. Um, I had some friends in Turkey who were um, doing activism work regarding, you know, getting uh, um, um, information, you know, through the news feeds and everything. Um, did some stuff with, with Tor and trying to make sure that people could stay connected um, and get, you know, word out to the rest of the world in these authoritarian regimes where, um, you know, they could just lock down the internet and you could didn't have the, the option to do that. It was very difficult for journalism. Um, and I came to realize that this thing that I cared about so much in my private life and things that I thought you know, really mattered to the world and to history, um, the stewardship, uh, data stewardship, data privacy, transparency, uh, the justice of information access, I started, it started to dawn on me, oh, this is the thing I can do as a job. Um, I can I can do this professionally, um, but I need to figure out how to do it. So uh, for a little while there, I was really looking into doing a coding boot camp, which, though they're typically less expensive than graduate programs, are still a good chunk of change. You know, there are some that offer scholarships, but uh, for the most part, and where I was in Dallas as well, um, I, I I was looking for something, and I don't need to go into the details of that. There's a variety of coding boot camps. I have a lot of research still on my laptop about them. If you want me to to guide you on that. <laughs> um, but I was this close to, to starting one, uh, but felt really dissatisfied with what I found there because even though like the tech skills that I thought I needed to brush up on um, were you know part of the curricula, I didn't really see anything about like ethics, um, about you know well maybe we can but should we, <laughs> and how have the things that we've done contributed to uh, the challenges that you know are currently ongoing in the world? And since that time, we've seen even more so that explosion of of questioning um, these things, right? About um, like. Facebook and Cambridge Analytica and like the this past week a whole thing with Facebook and their developer app was in the news like maybe when did it break yesterday day before yesterday um, so I was going to do coding because I thought that was maybe the closest way that I could could get into this line of work that I wanted and luckily I had a friend that I made at the school where I was working at he said no you're a librarian <laughs> You need to go get a library degree, and I didn't know that librarians worked in this area. Um, so thankfully, she was there to guide me. Um, so I started the grad program at UNT right after that. Um, and I think you can see through some of the projects that I've worked on. Um, I think they reflect my interest in these particular areas. There are some other things that I've done with helping with like Code for Lib and a few other like more data-oriented um, projects. Um, there's a little bit more on my website that's really out of date. Okay, um, so now diverse residency. Um, I graduated in. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I graduated in August, like I said, um, and at the time, you know, I was still able to work for a little while at UNT on this grant-funded project, uh, the Peggy project that I mentioned earlier. Which is, by the way, sorry, I keep using the acronym. It's Preservation of Electronic Government Information, um, and you can find out more at PeggyProject.org. Um, and. Um, I was working there and really wanted to take my time with figuring out what my first job was going to be. I was, I, despite you know the credentials that I had on paper, I still felt like I really didn't have um, a thorough understanding of academic libraries or librarianship as a whole. I kept you know every few months turning around and finding this other thing that librarians could do that I had no idea about. Um, so after you know two two and a half years in the master's program, I still felt like I had a lot of gaps in my understanding of what was involved in librarianship and what the potentials were, and I was, I was really afraid of, you know, immediately having to jump to a, um, you know, any job that would have me, um, and sort of getting stuck in one particular career path without really having been able to explore my options. So when I learned about library diversity residencies, um, it was, um, it, sounds, it was perfect for me. So the typical de definition of diversity residencies is there are library programs that are um, post-MLS, um, aimed at providing recently graduated professionals with work experience, um, and they have a particular focus on mentorship um, and recruitment and retainment um, of more diverse to, in order to, to further diversify the workforce. Um, 
the thing that really appealed to me about residency was that one, it did have, mm, it's not an internship, but the way that a lot of them are structured is in a lot of ways similar sometimes to internships in that you get to rotate between different divisions or some of them are more project-based. Um, so you get a bit of more of um, what I felt was the potential for a high-level overview of different departments. Um, because again, like I said, the thing that I was concerned about was getting work you know, as, a, as a subject liaison or something and just doing that forever and ever and then realizing 20 years later, oh, there's this other thing that would have been even more perfect that I would have loved and just not being able to, to pivot over to that. Um, so that's one thing that really appealed um, to me about it. Um, and this definition comes from, and the, the citation is there, but it's a little small, I don't know if you can see it. Um, but Jace Alston uh, was UNCG's first um, diversity resident, and like diversity resident librarian. Um, and this is uh, from his dissertation. He's continuing to do research on the particular topic of diversity residencies. And I do highly recommend it as reading, although it's, it's a bit hefty. I think it clocks in at almost 300 pages. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit about diversity and librarianship. Librarianship is an overwhelmingly white field. It, is, it just is. Um, according to the 29 to 2010 ALA stats, oh, sorry. 88% of credentialed librarians are white, 5% are African American, 3% are Asian Pacific Islanders, 3% are Latino or Latinx, and less than 1% either Native American or multiracial. Um, and diversity is allegedly, you know, a core value. It life. popped up there for oh, a minute and then it went away. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we're very distracted by the. The power I'm was strong with that one slide. <laughs> okay, well, I'll get back to it in just a minute. So, <laughs> diversity is. Yeah, well, they all are. <laughs> um, it's a core value of, of um, librarianship, and as mentioned by um, ALA libraries on the library website, uh, which I'm sure as library students, you guys have been to the ALA website and probably, hopefully, had a look at the, the core values. Yeah. Um, and if you look, like under the Bs, there's diversity. Um, which is a nice thing to have in our core yeah. values. Yeah, the, the one slide is something. Nice. Um, and you know, actually, this was something that was pitched to me by that my friend who um, told me about librarianship and the fact that libraries work in, you know, it's not just public libraries, which like I knew, like I kind of knew, but I also didn't because I never really stopped to think about it, you know, like my mental image of libraries was like, librarians was like most people, right, like public libraries. And I knew in theory that there were academic libraries because I had been to one. I had gone to that library many times. There were librarians, definitely. Um, and that there had been a library in my elementary school <laughs> and all of these things, but it just like never really occurred to me that you could be one of those and, or to question what they do. So thank you, Deanne, for letting me know <laughs> that this was an option. And one of the things she told me was, you know, like, yeah, you can go do like tech stuff, go be like a coding bro or whatever, if that's what you really want. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> this field has filled with like really good people and this, you know, diversity is one of our core values. And, you know, like, we might, you know, succeed or fail at like particular rates, but you know, maybe better or worse than any other discipline. But at least it's there. At least it's something that we like people think about and talk about. Um, and she said that she felt personally that, you know, as a whole, the discipline did better with it than you know a lot of others did. Certainly, probably better than Silicon Valley does. Um, and that, you know, at the very least, I'd be able to find like-minded people who cared about the things that I cared about, who had the same values that I had, who were at least trying to make this better. Um, so that that part of the pitch is is really what convinced me to, to give it um, some serious thought. Um, but let's have a look at these slides, yeah? Um, so librarians, the first, I don't know if you can see very clearly, it's actually very small here on our screen. Um, but if you look, and compare the racial compositions of libraries. The, the top graph is from 2010. Um, in the bottom is the U.S. population for 2011. Um, there's some rather stark disparities there. Um, this is something that was really, um, uh, from the histories that I've read, it was really sort of brought to the fore as an issue that you know ALA wanted to work on in particular in the 1990s, maybe 1990, exactly, actually. Um, uh, they did some studies. Um, on the uh, makeup of the uh, field as a whole and found it to be somewhat lacking. So at that time there were um, some like rather, you know, more serious 
Well, I don't know if that's fair. There were renewed efforts to um, increase the diversity of the field. Um, but it continues to be a problem to this day. I don't know if you guys um, look at you know the American Libraries magazine that's produced by ALA, but even in um, this past, uh, I think it was the November, December issue, there was an article called uh, Underrepresented, Underemployed, which you can find online if you go to the ALA Libraries magazine um, website. You can find the archive of it where this, this issue is, is discussed again at length. And then midwinter just ended, and there was a lot of stuff going on there regarding um, uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. There was uh, there was a lecture, and I don't think they archived the recording. They did. Well, they don't. Did they? No, they Facebook live streamed it, but I thought after it was over, you wouldn't be able to watch it anymore. Um. Oh, Allison has the magazine. I'm not yeah. sure. I think they they did show. They did provide a link to some information about her presentation. Yeah. Well, it's a, letter, it's a book. You know, yeah. like you can you can learn about her work and like can see other What's YouTube that title? videos. Um, White Fragility, um, and it's Robin D'Angelo. Robin D'Angelo, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think that's how. I don't know how many other ways you can pronounce that. Um, but it's, her work is really great, and I highly recommend looking it up. Um, but the long and the short of it is, it's, it's an issue that we continue to grapple with in librarianship and, you know, in, in the world, <laughs> the United States as a whole. Um, but since we're particularly concerned about our discipline, our field, um, it's, a, it's a thing that continues to be an issue. Even here at, you know, UNCG um, in the um, LIS program, um, we're a minority-serving institution. We're in North Carolina, um, and our program is still largely white. Um, so in the 90s, there were uh, many efforts to address this. The residency, the diversity residencies, my understanding is actually the first ones existed before then. Um, but the 90s kind of um, brought renewed interest and effort um, in ensuring the viability of these kinds of programs. One of the programs that was started is something called Spectrum Scholars, uh, which I think was 1997 um, is when that first began. So that's a scholarship for um, um, to, I know, the like young professionals, and just in general, right? Who, mm, yeah, no, I need to look that up. Sorry, I'm like, I'm aware of the Spectrum Scholars group, I should share this, but I'm not mm -hmm. one, and um, I didn't apply for that scholarship, so I'm not actually aware of the details of that. But you can do the Google, because you're a librarian. <laughs> um, and um, it's a scholarship, um, you know, there's there's an award for it, it's up on the website, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Um, and another of the things that, you know, um, was one of the other efforts, sorry, I'm getting really dry mouth right now. Another one of the efforts was the diverse, was renewed interest in efforts for the diversity residencies. So I'm going to talk a little bit now. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, yeah, sorry. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, I should have, I meant to bring my own, but I left my coffee because it's in my office. Um, so the diversity residency is here at UNCG. Um, I'm the sixth one. Um, there have been five before me. I mentioned Jace Alston before. Um, he's continued to do great work and research on the topic of diversity residencies. Um, and uh, Dr. Letitia Velez. Oh, I said Jason. Doc, Dr. Alston, sorry. <laughs> um, and Dr. Letitia Velez is a lecturer here um, in our program. She came back after going out to get her PhD. Um, the others have gone on to do great things as well. So as one of the comparatively longer running programs or consecutively running programs, um, the credentials, thank you so much, um, of this particular program, I felt, were pretty well established. Um, I reached out to, to find out what, what I could about the experience of the prior residents here uh, before I began, and the, the, the resident prior to me, Janae Solomon and Jay Bell, were kind enough to, to speak to me one-on-one -on -one and let me know what they thought of it when I was in the middle of my application process. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I had slight concerns about was, um, you know, if you talk to other librarians who are people of color, um, one of the things that comes up is, and, and this is not strictly restricted to librarianship, is anytime you get you know, a diversity position um, as the token person of color, um, a lot of times mm, you get hired just so they can check off, you know, that, like, check off that checkbox um, and do nothing further and are expected to bring the diversity programming in with you, moreover, um, and have no support whatsoever in actually doing any of the work, even if the diversity is necessarily the work that you were intended to be doing. Um, 
So something I was concerned about, um, but again, there were great credentials here. Gerald Holmes, um, who is uh, pictured there in the slide, is the diversity coordinator here, has been from the start, um, and is a wonderful mentor. Um, and again, I think the, the longevity of the program and the consistency of the program really spoke to um, the success and the effort that has been put into it here. Um, so that's persuading me to come here and speak. Um, <clears throat> let me see. A little bit more about residencies. Um, so, like I mentioned before, they're not internships. It, um, residents are full-time librarians um, with, you know, all the benefits and everything else that comes with full-time librarianship with full-time employment. Um, they typically run two to three years. This one here runs two years. Um, my term is 2018 to 2020. It typically starts in the summer, um, but I wasn't brought on until October. Um, so mine started a little late, but usually it's, you, know, you, you come in a little before the start of the fall semester, or at least that's how it's done here. There's not really a standard um, nationwide. Um, each university does it differently, and you just have to ask them and find out. Some of them are completely rolling and just will start you whenever you're available. Um, others um, are pretty strict on when they, they want the, the term to be. Um, some uh, universities have uh, multiple residents at the same time. Often, like some of them do a cohort, so they're all together at the same time. Others have been brought in, you know, so you've got like one who's in the second year, one who's in the third year, and they're there and bringing in the new one. Um, so you've got a, the, like a sort of peer network there as well. Here we've only got one, but maybe we can bring in another one over the next few years, we're hoping. Um, the way ours is structured here at UNCG is uh, rotation uh, through different divisions which you get to pick um, with, you know, input and suggestions from, you know, your mentor and others um, who, you know, will, will take into account what your interests are and what, what's available here. Um, others are more project-based, um, so they'll bring you in saying, okay, like we're specifically working on digitizing this, this, whatever, because you specifically want to work in you know, digital libraries and digital nations and all of this. Um, and again, there's not really like a list. The difficulty with finding them sometimes is that, um, you know, a university will have funding for a resident and then lose the funding and then not have a resident, you know, after that one leaves. Um, or they'll have additional funding so that they'll have more. Um, so it's not like there's a comprehensive, you know, spreadsheet out there that just lists um, exactly what you can find. Um, which is personal, so it's a irritation for me, but we're working on that. Um, let's see, what else should I talk about for the residency? Um, Any questions at this time? Thank you for the links, Allison. Yeah, it's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Going crazy over here. My question, I just had a question about like what have you, um, where in your rotations, where are you right now? Where do you plan to go? So I started, they started me in uh, ROI, which is, you know, our friends outreach instruction, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because I have some experience in doing reference uh, desk work um, at UNT. So because I started in the middle of the year, usually I would have been brought on in the summer. So I would have had like sort of the end of the summer to transition, get used to you know moving here and everything, um, <clears throat> get settled in, and then you know start the fall semester with the students. Um, so if you're doing instruction, a lot of that happens at the beginning of the semester. Um, and because I came in October and then I immediately left for a conference, and you know I didn't really start to be able to. I think I didn't even do my like HR orientation until like mid end of October. Um, because I was gone. Um, <clears throat> so um, it was a little difficult for me to actually start like doing things in ROI. Um, I did bring a lot of projects with me. So the PEGI project, um, we had our national forum meeting in December. So And also I work on that with um, Dr. Halbert, Dr. Martin Halbert, who is the Dean of Libraries here and was the Dean of Libraries at UNT uh, when I first started as a student there. Um, so we both had that point of connection. Also, um, there's another librarian here named Linda Kellum who works on it as well. Um, so there were the three of us here working on that project and it was kind of coming to a head in December. So that was one of the projects that I was working on. That, sorry, the PEGI project, I mentioned it earlier. Um, it's the preservation of electronic government information. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, preservation of electronic government information is focused on um, preservation of born digital government information specifically. Um, there's currently, I don't know if you guys learned about like um, FDLP, 
Federal Depository Library Program at all? I can give you a brief overview. Um, I personally have because I work on the desk, but you yeah. may need to share that. I mean, if nobody okay. else needs it, then I won't. There, there's no three minute elevator pitch for this. Like you have to give like ten minutes of like well back then, James Madison, blah blah blah. You know, like there's there's no easy explanation for it. But the website is peggyproject.org, P E G I project.org. Um and you can find all the information you need to about that. Nayla asked what the name was again. Peggy, Preservation of Electronic Government Information. Oh, F D L P. Yeah. Federal Depository Library Program. Um so it has to do with that. And basically the long and the short of it is there's an established workflow for print. Um, government information and distributing it out to the FDLP libraries and making sure that it's accessible to the public, uh, both born digital information, and there's so much of it being created by the government now, right? A lot of it, um, I mean, what information are we creating that isn't born digital, like created on your computer, first of all, right? <clears throat> and what we, how we define born digital is typically that it's meant to stay digital. Um, so just because you, you know, design a book or magazine cover on the computer, that doesn't necessarily qualify as born digital. If the intended um, distribution method is print, right? Like it's not meant to be posted online in that format or something like that and downloaded that way. So born digital is, you know, a lot of reports are, you know, um, put on government websites and intended to stay there. They're never put out into print because, like, why not? Why not save the paper, right? Um, but also, there's things being put out, like, you know, government agencies are producing things through, like, Facebook Live and Twitter. <laughs> when we started on Twitter <laughs> and archiving Twitter, you know, and recently, like, for instance, um, AOC, um, what's her, her name? Ocasio oh, Cortez. Yeah, um, was, you know, sort of, I don't know if like news is, is right, um, but there was, I, it was news to me because I pay attention to these things, these things, these are things I care about. Um, she's, she's really using Instagram really in, in really innovative ways, including Instagram, um, is it Instagram Live, the video feeds? Um, and uh, to, to speak directly to, you know, people and to her constituents, um, but the, the live videos are not permanent, they go away after a while. Um, and for people who, maybe want to study the use of social media and dissemination to the public by government officials, that would be really fascinating to have on hand as archive, right? Um, but there's not like policy saying that she has to have that because frankly all of her laws are super out of date. Um, I think even now one of the official methods of, of preservation includes magnetic tape. So way behind the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and like that's, those are things that I think are fascinating um, because you know it's, it's Something that should be preserved for you know transparency, sake, especially where the government is involved, right? For transparency and public accountability sake, but also like if you're a historian, you know, in 20, 30, 40, 100 years, like this might be stuff that you might want to have on hand. Um, so why shouldn't we try to preserve it, right? Um, so that's kind of some of the stuff that the Peggy Project works on. Although it's not mostly social media, mostly things like data sets um, and other information um, that's produced digital or digitally. Does that answer your question? Allison, do you mean um, kind of like scholarly books or just oh, regular? Yeah, sure. um, yeah. so I, I took... Because um, th you could get Deborah talking about this for a hot second. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I do have recommendations, and um, I can send out a list. Actually, um, so this is uh, a picture of my, my table. <laughs> These are my books of my laptop. Um, <clears throat> and okay, one of the ones nothing too scholarly, haha. Huh? Okay, so one of the ones that I recommend there, um, like you can see a little bit of it is, um, so you want to talk about race, um, and I think that one's just a really fantastic primer for discussing. Like it, it, it can be really challenging to talk about race issues, um, especially you know, it's a it's a Muslim and race thing, right? So if you've never talked about it before, um, if you've never really had to, to articulate to someone what privilege is, you know. Um, or what the difference is between individual acts of prejudice versus systemic oppression. Um, you know, if you don't practice it, it's, it's really difficult to bust it out in the middle of a heated conversation. <laughs> um, or maybe over Thanksgiving dinner, not that happened to me. <laughs> um, no, of course not. You know, um, then, you know, how, how do we go about the process of talking about it? And I think um, that book is, is a really great program for that. Um, the other book that's shown there is called Algorithms of Oppression by uh, Dr. Bethany Noble. Um, I had the pleasure of, of seeing her speak at the Open Access Conference at the University of North Texas not long after I started with the Peggy Project as a graduate student there. Um, it's a fantastic book, very easily readable, that talks about how, you know, like there's this idea that, um, well, Google pulled it up, the algorithm pulled it up, you know, like, and the, because the computer did it, it's cold and logical. 
um, and utterly without bias, which is pretty ridiculous considering that it's human beings who code them, right? We're the ones who decide what decisions it's making. We're the ones who train them. <laughs> um, but with like, there's lots of really funny memes on, about machine learning, if that's the thing that you care about, like me, because I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> utterly unrelated to my job, but I care about it because it's cool, um, because it's robots. Um, but um, there's lots of really great um, like posts floating around like on Reddit and stuff about machine learning gone wrong. <laughs> Um, like, you know, ways in which they've tried to teach <laughs> these um, bots, you know, how to do specific things or to, to do certain things or to navigate a game or something like that. And then the very creative ways in which they literally followed the instructions and utterly went off the wall um, in order to achieve their objective because uh, the humans did not think things through and did not think about things the way that a computer thinks about things. Um, so yeah, her book is really great. So those two I would definitely recommend. Um, I would also recommend, let me see. Oh, I'm just going to type them in here for you. Oh, sure. Um, the, oh, I see what you're doing. Um, Lisa is also going to be starting um, a crit lib reading group um, starting this Saturday, actually, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and they will be posting, you guys, you will be posting, we will be posting um, the readings from there. There will be a few scholarly works because uh, one of the points of this reading group is to maybe go over some of the foundational texts of critical theory, specifically critical race theory, because I know, um, at least for me and, you know, from other people that I've talked to, like the, the list of folks here, <laughs> um, that critical race theory isn't really something that a lot of us as librarians, like, really go over at all. Um, I was particularly interested in um, critical librarianship um, when I found out about it when I first started um, library school, but there wasn't anyone in my program who really worked on that, like, at all, like, in theory, like, almost never came up, maybe a little bit of grounded theory, and that was only when I took, like, a, a, a like, a, qualitative methodology course. Um, so my background is in anthropology, so I do have some understanding and background with like Foucault and that kind of thing, but that was like undergrad level, um, and it wasn't like I was, you know, a critical feminist scholar or anything. It was one class in my anthropology degree. Um, so the idea of this is to go over some of the foundational texts like Lord and Hooks and all of that um, and see how it applies to the practice of librarianship. So those are going to be a little bit more scholarly. Um, because they will be, you know, primarily short articles that you don't have to read entire long books. Um, but there will also be additional book recommendations alongside those. So you should keep up with that if you would like some more book recommendations. And also I can send out a list later, but it's basically going to be covering the same thing. So. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions online? What departments are you planning on looking after? Oh, I never fully answered your question, did I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm started in reference, um, and the answer is we're not really sure. Um, I had thought that maybe I would do um, ERIT, which is the technology vision um, stuff, wibbly wobbly tech thing here. Um, but the sort of things that they've got going on, like the projects they have and the kind of interests that I have don't necessarily slot one to one. Um, so I don't know that that'll be a good home for me as a as a an entire rotation per se. Um, but they do have lots of data that I want to work with, um, so I'll probably move into something like that um, in the summer or fall. Um, because I started so late in ROI last fall, um, I just continued and extended out that rotation rather than having an extremely short one that was like. October, November, and then it doesn't matter because no one's here for most of December. Um, we just extended that out further. So this semester I'm doing some instruction over in the library um, and going to be looking a little more closely at learning about the ACRL framework. We've got a librarian here, Jenny Dale, who works really closely um, on all of that and is a little bit expert on it. So I wanted to make as much use of that as I could because I frankly didn't learn much about it when I was in library school. Um, so I'm going to be looking at that and assessment. I have some background in usability studies um, as well as, of course, anthropology and qualitative methods and mixed methods, not as much quantitative, um, but I really feel like there's a lot of potential there that is lacking or potential there that is really overlooked 
it, like we have the technology, literally, um, through usability studies to capture user behavior in a lot of interesting ways that's not strictly limited to, you know, how do students access our databases. Um, that technology can be used for a variety of things that I think people just, you know, don't, are not imaginative enough with. And I think it's a great way to capture some quantitative data. Um, so I'm going to probably be looking um, into the summer and fall at, like, seeing if I can create a project with that um, to do some, like, mixed method um, assessment studies. Um, so as we come to a close here, is there anything that you think, as a student organization, LISA members should be paying attention to, whether it be in the news, whether it be um, specific authors with specific work coming out, or um, I know this is a very big question, but just anything you think, because the majority of our students, if they're not, you know, I mean, I'd say majority of us are cisgendered white females. Um, some of us are not cisgendered, some of us are not white, some of us are not females. But the majority, mm -hmm. yes. So what would you encourage us to do to grow in our knowledge along with reading books and articles? And um, You know, a lot of the problems <clears throat> with, before I pivoted to librarianship, I was working in education. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the, 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 in my opinion, the single biggest factor um, to contribute to success of students, of like all students and especially students of color, you know, rise and tide lifts all boats, was desegregation. It is desegregation. And it continues to be an issue with like charter schools and there's, um, there's a really great podcast series, I can't remember the name of it, that um, did um, some great journalistic work regarding um, this, I think it was in Chicago or a Chicago suburb, I believe, regarding um, like charter schools and some, like there was a school district that just went kaput. And so suddenly all of these students who were in a primarily you know, minority serving district um, had to be bussed in to these primarily white schools and people flipped out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and is it officially like policy segregation? No, but when you base, you know, school district um, financing on property taxes, and redlining is a thing that continues to have like a strong legacy, you end up with segregation regardless, right? <clears throat> um, and then don't get me started on charter schools and things like that. That's another thing. Yeah. Um, but what they found out after this happened was it increased, like all of the students' grades went up, that, you know, the students, um, like their relationships to their peers who were people of color, you know, um, their like general ideas about like not just race, but general openness to like other concepts in general, like skyrocketed. And all it is is just exposure. It's just that they had friends in their classroom who were black people now, yeah. right? And that's all that it is. Um, so yeah, read lots of things. Read the scholarly works. You know, read um, diverse books. Um, you know, we need diverse books. I'm sure you guys have heard about that. That's great. Like. Don't just recommend them. Yeah, don't just yeah, don't just recommend like read them. You know, like you know, it opens up your imagination all that. But you just you need to to just hang out with more people of color. <laughs> you need to hang out with more queer people. You need to hang out with more trans people, autistic people, disabled people, people who are not like you. You know, and that's how segregation and you know the um, even sort of you know one of the things with half Asians that I did was the model minority myth Asian, and these things perpetuate and persist because you know they don't get to these communities don't mingle much, right? And so you have people who only know about people through stereotypes, and even when it's a so-called positive stereotype, it still is what it is. Um, and, and then those people make decisions based on that regarding hiring, <laughs> or you know, like how much you should be paid, um, or when they're looking at your CV and how hard you might have actually worked to get that degree um, or that particular grade, because they have certain thoughts about how apt what your aptitude might be based on presumptions that they've got, because they don't know real human beings who fit into these categories, right? Um, and the diversity residencies are specifically focused on ethnic and racial minorities, but, you know, this, like, advice, which is just meet more people who are not like you, applies to all of the things, right? You know, like, I am cisgender, um, I am able-bodied, you know, I am seeing and hearing, you know, um, these are all things that I personally, as, like, a are um, things that I need to work on, um, things that I'm continually trying to work on. And it's like, you can't just go on like matchmaking dates to be like, I'm looking for, yeah. you know, like 
queer people of color to befriend um, because I want them to improve my life and make me a better person. Like, don't do that. That's awful. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Um, but there are things you can do to intentionally make sure that you are trying to um, to be involved in those communities. Like, is your church all white? You know, like, there's an option right there. Like, are, like do you go to your local community centers um, and volunteer there? Like, if you have, I mean, if you have the time and the spoons and all of that, right? You know, like there are ways to um, inject more color into your life in a lot of ways. Um, we just have to be willing to make the effort. Right? Yes, sir. And Deborah, thank you, and apologies for being late. I had another meeting. Oh, no worries. Seven. Um, so just one other uh, idea I'll throw out is uh, even if you have no interest in public librarianship, consider volunteering at your local library. Most public libraries. <laughs> especially here in Greensboro, mm -hmm. are uh, significantly more diverse uh, than, than uh, an average college campus. And UNCG is pretty diverse to begin with, but uh, if you go to um, uh, Glenwood Grants Library, the downtown Grants Library, the Glen Chavis, the, Glen, um, uh, the Hemphill Branch, uh, these, are, these are spaces that uh, pull together people from cross-section of society in a way that a college campus does not. Um, and so it's, uh, and they're always looking for volunteers, so. Yeah, that's great. And for Greensboro specifically, I recently learned about like the Beloved Community Center yeah, yeah. Um, and other things here that have this huge history of activism, um, particularly when it comes to, to anti-blackness um, and white supremacy. Um, with the Civil Rights era and like this long legacy of civil rights work here. So that's, um, and that's on my to-do list, I couldn't go mm -hmm. to their little lunch meeting um, yesterday because I had another meeting, but I signed to go next week. I learned about it last week from one of the other librarians here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another way like to get involved in their local community um, because, you know, segregation is it's an active choice, even though a lot of times because of the decisions behind it, especially for white, seem invisible because they don't affect you. Um, but we do make active choices about who we choose to befriend, who we, you know, choose to spend our time with, with the people that we um, invest in. Um, and a lot of times these are like subconscious um, and we hang out with communities that are like us, like everybody that I do, you know. Um, so it's important to, to make those active choices if you want to change things about yourself. Because it's an ongoing process, right? You don't decide. You know, I'm, I'm not a racist, I'm not a bigot, I'm not homophobic, and then you no longer you are, right? Like, that's not how that works. It's a constant, active, ongoing um, process because you're not only constantly learning new things about these categories that, you know, don't apply to you or that maybe you didn't think apply to you and maybe one day will um, because there's no guarantee that you will, you know, if you're able-bodied, that you will forever remain so. Or in, like, my experience with a lot of people who learn more about queer communities and realize they are LGBT in a way, right? the more that they learn about it, things like that. Um, you know, not only is it a constant process of learning, it's a constant process of unlearning. Um, and we all have to do better and work with each other to be better at it. Um, question. With the diversity resident, mm -hmm. where, you're a very strategic thinker, and I know you can't call your next shot, but where <laughs> are you hoping to position yourself or use the position to position? So one of the reasons why I decided to stick with ROI was because after I had stayed here a little bit um, through the fall, and you know, I had I didn't think I was going to stay in ROI because my goal is not like you know like subject liaison um, kind of like like it would be fine, but there's other things that I'm interested in too, and I was like, well, I'm going to focus on learning about those things while I'm here. Um, but the longer that I stay here, the more that I noticed that the approach here to teaching, um, to library instruction, seemed a little different than what I had had seen before. Um, which is why I decided, um, you know, it took like Gerald at um, home, my supervisor, the residency coordinator, kept asking, well, what do you think? Do you have any ideas? I'm like, oh, I don't know yet. Like, I'm still exploring, you know. Um, but the longer that I stayed, the more I realized that um, there's a lot about the way instruction is done here that I could learn from. Um, you know, I have some interest in instruction experience, so I'm not going to have a background in teaching, but teaching university students is very different <laughs> from what I had done before. Um, and also mapping it to like the, the ACRL framework um, and that kind of thing, that sort of assessment is something that I don't like the experience that I have with it. 
um, like STEM and STEAM training, so like primary school and that kind of thing, like very different, right? Like there's a lot of commonalities, but I wanted more hands-on with that. So I was thinking strategically regarding, you know, ROI, and that's why I decided to extend it, was I realized there's a lot that I could learn here. Um, and specifically, you know, Jenny Dale is the librarian here who is like really great at the ACL framework. So I'm, I went to her and said, I want to learn this from you, mm -hmm. you know? And I was the ROI librarian who said, you guys are good teachers, I want to learn this from you. Um, so I'm still figuring out what my next stuff is going to be, probably something assessment-sided. Um, so I'll probably be looking at, um, after doing some teaching, then see if I can um, come up with an assessment project or something that needs to be done here. I work with Kathy Carl on that, probably. Um, and also, I have a lot of interest, as you're probably aware, with data. Um, and we just got a brand new GIS librarian who started in January. She is great. Her name's Joe Klein. Follow her on Twitter. Um, and. Um, I like we all decided that we didn't want to like overwhelm her with all of my like data curiosity and projects that I wanted to do when she first started. So letting her fill in a little bit, Joe, if you watch this later. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about it at coffee at four today. Um, <laughs> um, so there's some data projects that I'm interested in. There's a fledgling open data uh, uh, portal kind of thing that's happening in Gilbert County that I've heard about. Um, so I've got experience with that in Denton and I'd be happy to bring my experience with organizing those events here. Um, so that's probably something that's going to happen towards the fall. Um, so, you know, to answer your question, something, something assessment, something, something data, you know, question, question, what profit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we yeah. have any more questions online, anybody? All right, well, thank you guys for letting me ramble at you for a good 45 minutes. I appreciate it. Um, if you have any other questions, let me know. I will get further recommendations to Tori and um, uh, fix the, that one reference on my slides there. Yeah, and we'll get everything over to Allison so she can repost for us. Thank you. Um, and also, I just want to say really quick, if you liked that and you enjoyed Deborah, uh, feel free to stick around for the weekend. Uh, we will be meeting as our Crip Lib book group, um, excuse me, book club meets here in the School of Education building at 302. We're also online in the same link that you got on today, um, and that will be 10 a.m. on Saturday. If you're in town, feel free to stop by. We'll maybe have a little bit of coffee, some snacks here and there, but yeah, that'll be it. So thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.